Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you. Well, in my last job, I used to constantly marvel at how a small place like our Gibraltar could produce so many overachievers in life. And therefore, it's a great privilege to follow uh, a fantastic address from one of those overachievers. Uh, well done to uh, Gibraltar's Olympian, uh, Georgina Kassar. Well, uh, in the British system, of, uh, of politics and the change of power um, is designed to lead to a very immediate and sharp execution. British politicians fall from office suddenly and, and, uh, and from a very great height. So one Thursday evening, your chauffeur comes to pick you up at home as usual. He drives you to the John McIntosh Hall uh, you attend the vote count, you lose, uh, and the first sign that you get of the suddenness and the precipice that is the fall from political leadership office in the British system, the way the British have designed it, is that all of a sudden, the man who drove you to the John McIntosh Hall is no longer holding the door open for you, uh, he, he's holding it open for somebody else and that you're walking home. <laughs> the next morning, you wake up and you say, ah, I'm going to go answer that email from the foreign secretary or whatever. And you say, oh no, hang on. I've got nowhere to go and nothing to do. So you start interfering in the domestic arrangements at home. All the things that you've never shown the slightest uh, bit of interest in before, all of a sudden you're an expert and you've got to do it, and you've got to, you're just going to be allowed to carry on basically uh, control freaking, I suppose. It would be the way most people put it. I remember having dinner here at the convent with Mrs. Thatcher. She was a personal friend of the then governor, Sir Richard Luce, and she said to me, Peter, never forget, there are two professions that always end in tears. Boxing and political leadership. <laughs> and she was right about that. But I remember then at that time resolving uh, that I would try that it should not be that way for me. I've always had an understanding and an acceptance that really political leadership in a real vibrant democracy like Gibraltar is a temporary job. Losing to the will of the people is as important a part of the role as winning by the will of the people. And if you really assimilate that lesson as a conviction, losing in a democratic election is not as difficult uh, as people might imagine. So I lost in 2011, not by very much. They're not very much, they're not by... <laughs> <clears throat> they're not by very much bit of it enabled me to persuade myself that even though you had unceremoniously deprived me of my chauffeur-driven car, <laughs> that you didn't think I had been the worst ever Chief Minister of Gibraltar. So anyway, stay or go. You know, 16 years is a very long time. It's a great privilege and honor. Um, I mean, I remember, uh, uh, of course, there's huge strains on the family. You've got to take that into account. And when I... This was thinking, well, do I hang around to go round the block again, or do I call it quits? I had these words reverberating in my ear. We had gone uh, to the royal wedding, the last royal wedding in London, Prince uh, William, and afterwards the foreign secretary had in, in, uh, invited all the hosts to Lancaster House for lunch, and there was a very senior official sitting next to me. I, I won't mention his name in case he's embarrassed by it. And, and he, says, uh, he says to me, but uh, Chief Minister, isn't it all looking a bit North Korean in Gibraltar now? By which, of course, he meant, haven't you been there long enough? And isn't it time? <laughs> and isn't it time, really, that you started thinking about making way for somebody else? That was the first hint that the establishment in London might think it's time, it's time for change. So I'm sure, I'm sure that, is, uh, that is paranoia on my part. <laughs> so... Once you decide whether you love the job so much, which of course I did, 
but that that love for the job means that you were not able to let go of it, you know, it's like a sort of a drug. Once you've decided whether that's your case or whether your case is, thank you very much, it's been 16 marvelous, privileged years, it's been a great honor, but now people have decided that it's time for something different and therefore you, you, you retire, you, you leave the stage. Uh, once you've uh, decided uh, which of those that is, and I chose the latter, then you've got to decide how you leave that stage. And really what I'd like to share is some thoughts with you this, uh, this afternoon about how uh, I uh, decided I would go about trying to cushion this great blow. You know, uh, Gibraltar, uh, loves its political leadership, trusts its political leadership. Uh, the result of that is that there is a huge amount of deference for the chief minister. The chief minister becomes very powerful. And, you know, we're all human. We all like, we all like to be treated like that, I, I have to confess. <laughs> so how to cushion this great fall from a great height, which happened suddenly uh, at about 2 o'clock in the morning, one Thursday night, early Friday morning. <laughs> Thank, thank you all very much, by the way. <laughs> well, the first thing that I decided was that I would try to make it a new life opportunity rather than treat it as a disaster. You know, there are very few professions from which people get the opportunity to retire very early and do something different with their lives. But of course, in this profession, politics, that decision is taken out of your hands. So it doesn't even require bravery on your part to decide to let go of your security blanket to do something else. You all sensibly make the decision for us, uh, and, uh, and so we're found having to do that. But if you see it as a new opportunity, and for me it has been a new opportunity, not just in terms of the way that I have been able to conduct my family life and my leisure life, but frankly, and I, I say this unashamedly, the way it, having drifted back to the legal profession, I have been able to enhance my income to the benefit uh, of the lifestyle that I have been able to offer my family who paid uh, a price in that area uh, for so many years. So, uh, new life opportunity, not a, tra not a tragedy. Next, and most importantly, personally, for you, for me in that case, don't bear grudges against anybody. Uh, you know, you've had political opponents, you've had political friends, you've had people who have been very nasty about you, but you've got to put it all... If you, if you bear grudges against people, this is a valuable lesson in life, not just for politicians. If you bear grudges and resentment of people, they don't know. You're just burning yourself up inside. It's wor it worked for me enormously. Not even, I decided, would I bear a grudge against that campaign that said that I was an addict to debt and that there was then too much debt? Ah, the good old days, where are they? <laughs> <laughs> nor even, nor even that the airport was too big. I think that I was presenting it to a prize or something. You know, if, uh, the other day I drove past the airport and there were six 737s, Monarch 3, EasyJet 3, some other. Not even the airport is too big campaign, I decided, I would not bear a grudge against. And then I decided that I would slip back as quietly as possible into the obscurity from which I had come. In other words, there are so many political leaders around the world that then feel that they've got a sort of divine right to stay on the stage. All right, you've been made to move off the center stage. They can't quite make it to the wings. And even if they do make it to the wings, they always want to be shouting from it. <laughs> you know, and a sort of a permanent commentary from so-called elder statesmen. And I decided that this was not really, it wasn't fair on my successor in, uh, in, uh, in uh, my party, and it wasn't fair to my successor in, uh, in the job that I had just uh, been quietly relieved from. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, I decided that that's the way I would do it. I would slip back, drift back into legal practice quietly, uh, and uh, open my mouth only when I was invited to do so. Uh, so that, of course, gave me and gives me credibility for what I really want to do, which is to always be available for the government of Gibraltar to help and advise um, uh, 
whenever I can, whenever it would be helpful in the interest of Gibraltar, which is what I quietly do without behind the scenes on issues as and when they arise and the present government is able to benefit, not necessarily from advice about how I would have handled it, but simply from historical factual knowledge of how the problem arose in the first place, etc., etc. And I think that that is how I can best be of service to Gibraltar. And I have to say, and I have to say, it's gone very well for me indeed. Uh, a, a, a lady stopped me in the streets uh, uh, about a year ago and said, uh, uh, "Sir Peter, you are even more handsome." <laughs> At the time, <laughs> At the time, I thought it was a compliment, but when I left, I said, well, "Hang on, <laughs> this might not be as complimentary as I had thought." So anyway. Gibraltar is unique, absolutely unique. And you won't find anywhere else on the planet a place that, for being so small, has a political class government that enjoys so much self-governance and so much, so much self-governance powers with such a successful economy at its disposal, but which generates so many difficult issues. In other words, a combination of smallness, self-degree and extent of self-governance, uh, the issues that we have to grapple with, the success of our economy, which itself needs management, issues like our disagreements with Spain, uh, issues in relation to our very peculiar status within the EU, um, events that happen, you know, my successors grappled during the last few days with that very serious occurrence at the airfield, uh, which as far as I can tell was handled uh, just as I would have liked to have handled it myself. Uh, and, of course, events of all, of all kinds. So I've been very fortunate to have been entrusted with you uh, for this for 16 years. The Chief Minister has three basic functions. The, the most important one is that he is the chief firefighter for issues. I mean, I remember uh, dealing uh, with issues such as the fishing crisis. Remember the fishing crisis and all the demonstrations? <laughs> HMS Tireless, the nuclear submarine that was going to blow up. It would, if we sort of didn't send them pack it. Remember the cruise ship Aurora with a, a sort of ship full of people with Nova virus and nobody else floating around the Mediterranean for two weeks. <laughs> nobody would let nobody would let them in. And then, and then of course and then of course uh, the joint sovereignty issue too. The second most important issue is the economy. The economy is important for two reasons. Firstly, because it creates personal economies which result in quality of lives for you and your families but also um, because without economic prosperity, there can be no political security for this community, which is the third function of the chief minister, which is to ensure always the political security of Gibraltar. First of all, that our sovereignty should not be put in doubt and should not be thought of by others to be things for them to decide over your heads and behind your backs. Secondly, that the people of Gibraltar and only the people of Gibraltar have the right to choose about their future political status. The right to choose, by the way, is, it creates in the Chief Minister the obligation to protect your right to choose. I never took the view that it was my role to tell you how you had to think and, how, and what you had to choose. My role was to pre preserve your freedom to do that for yourself. And thirdly, of course, to enhance Gibraltar's international respect so that when we claim and profess to be a self-governing people worthy of a seat at international tables, we are able to be thought of in that light. And there's a, a little anecdote that I can tell you about. I remember uh, if, if I were ever to, to succumb to the uh, temptation to write a memoirs, which I probably, oh my God, 59 seconds already. All right. I mean, I remember once in my, my Tuesday afternoon clinics, uh, uh, so people would come in and uh, have their 20-minute slots to tell me whatever they wanted, and this lady came in. I remember she was from the Glasses estate, and she was telling me that the Buildings and Works Department uh, had uh, come in to fix her boiler. They had connected the cold water pipe, but not the whole... And at that point, the telephone rings, and it was the Foreign Secretary. So I had the Foreign Secretary in one ear. This lady, who hadn't realized... I <laughs> 
I was on the phone bleating to me about her hot water pipe hadn't been connected. And I said, this is what being the chief minister of Gibraltar is. <laughs> Nowhere else on the planet would a political leader find himself in that position. Of course, in the six seconds that I have left, I will tell you that uh, I am clear that, uh, can you give me 30 more seconds? <laughs> Thank you. Trying to confine me to 15 minutes. I remember once after a Chamber of Commerce annual dinner, I gave a two and a half hour after dinner speech. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, uh, what was I going to say to you? Yes, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, once I was in, uh, in, uh, in the Foreign Office, and a, an official that was not involved with Gibraltar, but which I knew to be a great friend of Gibraltar, stops me in the corridor and says, Chief Minister, you know, you have something in common with Saddam Hussein. And I said, oh my God, oh my God, he's heard that they call me the emperor in Gibraltar. Or like that. And he says, no, 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 no. Honestly, you have something in common with Saddam Hussein. You and Saddam Hussein are the only people that could call a referendum and get 99% for the answer that you want. <laughs> it, we're talking about, we're talking about the George Summit. Uh, and, and finally, to leave you, uh, I'm very clear that uh, we got some things right and we got some, some things wrong. I like to think that on balance, our 16 years in office was on balance positive and good for Gibraltar. Uh, I'm fully aware of the errors. But, People sometimes ask me, in those 16 years, what is the one issue that you would single out as your most valuable legacy to future generations of Gibraltar? There is no doubt in my mind what the answer to that question. It isn't the economy and tax cuts or the new constitution or, or, or even the joint, the joint sovereignty battle. It is simply this, the double lock on sovereignty. In other words, that I was able to persuade my good friend then, the Foreign Secretary, to commit, not just in terms of the preamble to the Constitution, that the UK would not transfer our sovereignty against our wishes, but they wouldn't even sit down with the Spanish government or anybody else to discuss our sovereignty unless we, the people of Gibraltar, were content for them to do so. That has made our political future as a people as secure as it could possibly be and as it had never been before. And that, in my opinion, is the most valuable legacy that I will be able to tell my grandchildren when I bounce them on my knee, uh, if they press me, and the one that I am proudest of. Thank you very much indeed for, for your... Uh...